All right, so today we're going to be talking about the music in Pokemon Coliseum. It looks like Chris is rather excited for this, I don't know. Um, so actually, just so I can get a feel for the room, who here has played Pokemon Coliseum before? Oh, like, great showing, one of my players. Like, who here know, at least knows of the game? At least, like, knows about it, okay. Um, cool, so just for a little bit of context, there's a game released for the GameCube, I believe in 2003, I was actually 2002. Uh, it was the first story-driven um, th uh, three-dimensional Pokemon game. Sure, Pokemon Stadium did exist, um, but it was not story-driven. It was much more just about the multiplayer and just getting through battling a bunch of people. It was a lot of fun. But Pokemon Coliseum actually put a plot into it. So the main I um, and so the main thing that I want to talk about in this game is again the music and how it gets able to build a consistent soundtrack throughout especially with the use of just thematic consistency. So like, for instance, one theme that is very pro uh, prominent in the game is this, especially if you've played the game, you'll know it. Like that is just, th just dispersed through the entire game. It just manipulates it in a bunch of different ways, and I'm going to be showcasing a couple examples of that. Uh, the first up, uh, first up is probably the most popular um, version of it, which is the Pirate Town theme, which is probably one of my favorite tracks in the game. So you got that bass line that's just keeping that theme all throughout. And then from there, it just goes into this um, nice jazz, um, jazz piece, get this nice sax that's going on top of it. It's a really cool theme. Uh, and so, uh, and so that's like one, um, and so this is one place where it's used. But then it just takes it and morphs it in just very slight ways throughout the piece. For instance, in the dungeon of this game, uh, which is the pirate building, so you're actually, there's this evil syndicate known as Cypher, I think that's how you pronounce it. Uh, and so, um, you don't, we don't really need to go into the plot of the game, especially if you guys haven't played it, probably won't, but probably no spoilers there. Um, but you're going, you're going to invade the facility in this town, and then there's a piece that takes that theme, which is, which actually, if we compare it to the old one, is actually, it's very similar in that respect, but it just, it takes it, takes away that swing, and then just flattens it out, makes, just gets this consistent bass line. So that's just a way, musically, thematically, you don't even need to know where these places are. You know that these two places are just linked, just through the music. And I think that's one of the most important things in making a video game soundtrack, is that you can make a bunch of really, really cool songs, but to actually string them together and to just make them all connect to one another in a few different ways, whether it be through the instrumentation, which you could hear that there are these diff similar sound fonts throughout these two tracks, but the main thing is just that theme that connects them, that bridges those two. Another one, which is a connected place in the game, but a much more sinister, a much darker area, known as the under, takes this theme, but then makes it a little bit grittier. And so pretty much, as the name might suggest, this is pretty much kind of the criminal underbelly of this town. And so you get the same theme, but it's much darker, much more sinister, and just much more foreboding. Especially you get this nice, like, weird, sporadic uh, parts in the, in the piano that just interrupts um, the original theme. And again, we're just hearing another example of how it's transformed and used again. So we've seen a number of examples of how it's used, and this is all in just one area of the game. And so just through just manipulating this one, this one measure of music, it's able to just draw connections between the, all three of these areas. Now we're going to move to just one more area, as if I didn't drive the point home enough already. Um, this is um, a place known as the Snag and Hideout, which is, we don't really need to go into context, context but again, it'll take this theme and it'll, it'll get twisted to, again, connect it, but still give it its own little flavor. 
So. So it's awkwardly kind of going in between these two different styles, this one, um, this one more straight line. And then just go, and then it goes back and forth between that and this swing sort of thing, which kind of actually represents the place where this is. It's just an absolute mess because early in the game it actually got blown up by our main character, protagonist. Um, you'll need to play the game to figure out why that was. But, um, so, again, just um, with this music, we're draw be able to draw a connection between all these different places throughout the game under what I probably call the main theme of the entire series. Um, and actually, it even, and then let's go to the um, to the pretty much the boss battles of this game, the Cipher Admins. Um, pretty much the, um, these um, this song takes that theme again, but instead of having this more oh wait, this is the wrong wrong one. Whoops. Uh, there we go. Uh, so pretty much, instead of taking it and like we've seen much more kind of grittier, more uh, jazz um, jazz arrangements of it, like they like, they've had their own sort of a similar tone in a sense though, though to varying degrees, whether they be a lot grittier or this kind of more upbeat jazz sort of swing version. This one takes it a much more kind of I guess I'll use epic as a word, although it's not like grand in scale like this full orchestra, but it takes it and just strains it out, prolongs it. Gives it to the strings work much more before we've seen it in the bass line. And then throughout, it'll kind of develop on it and it'll start to use it in a bunch of different ways. It's also just a cool piece of music. And then from there, it's, it goes off to the races. So we've seen just how this theme is used in a, just throughout Pokemon Coliseum. Uh, in a bunch of different areas. It's actually, I would even argue that's the main theme of just the entire series because it even comes back in one, in pretty much one of the premier battles in Pokemon XD. Actually, who has anyone played that game aside from Chris? Have you played Pokemon XD? No? Oh my gosh, I'm alone on this one? Uh, I'm pretty much, um, there's at one point in the game where you actually fight pretty much a, um, um, where you fight a Lugia and you capture it. It's, one, it's pretty much the premier Pokemon of the game. And in the battle, this theme comes back. So again, yeah, it's just so it just takes it just takes this one little thing and just transforms it in a bunch of different ways. And so you really it saves time from the composer's part because you don't need to spend time making another melody. You can just use the same thing over and over and over again and using it in new different ways. Undertale is another premier example of this. I'm sure we all know about the ways that, oh, Spear of Justice is actually just waterfall sped up, or a bunch of other different random cases where there are really, I'd say, only four or five unique melodies in that game. And um, Polo Coliseum does something different, but, um, but not quite to that extreme. So I, now I wanted to actually take a look at pretty much the opening cin cinematic of the game. Um, we can just listen to the music, but we're going to listen to this all the way through. And we're going to take apart some of the motifs that are used in here. Break this down um, a few, a three key sections of this piece. The first is actually just the opening. 
this this um this more peaceful, somber chord um, chord opening. And we're gonna compare that to the world map theme, which is crazy. So unlike other Pokemon games where you just it's just one continuous world, you actually have a map where you select where to go from that map. So just in a hub world. Uh, and this is the theme that plays during that. So we get that same horn again. And so I, I personally think that this opening of the cinematic is just an homage to what to what will be coming later on in another piece of music. Next, we're going to take a look at, actually this is a little bit coincidental, I think, but it, So that little thing right there, ba, 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 is actually used in the Po1 XD, just a complete follow, um, follow game. It's never used, this motif is never used again in Coliseum, but then suddenly, in the next game, we get, oh, let's see here. So we get that same exact motif back when it just hasn't been referenced for an entire game. I think that was coincidental, it's coincidental but I just find that funny how that worked out. Then there's one more uh, particular part of this opening cinematic, which is actually very, um, I think, one of the coolest things about this game soundtrack. Let's see. Oh, there. Our... Oh, yeah. All right, so that part. So that theme is just dispersed into a few key moments throughout the game that really give the player a sense of progression throughout. So we've got, it, it is established at the very end at the highest point of this opening cinematic. So obviously it's going to be, at least in the, in the player's head, at least somewhat. Then, now, let's look at the opening battle of the game. Or the music that plays during that. That's okay. Um, but I would call, I would pretty much call this, in a sense, like the player's theme. And it's, it's like, it will show just the sense of progression throughout the game. So obviously we hear that, um, that similar theme. Structure, it changes up the rhythm in a little bit to give it to make it fit the tone of the piece, but those that melody is still there. And so this is like the very beginning of the journey. This is literally the music that plays on your very first battle. You're against two zigzag goons. It's no threat whatsoever. It's a push up. Um, but it comes up again in a couple of key places as you slowly develop as a trainer, as and you just get better and you just get stronger. Hope. So let's actually look at the Cypher Admin theme one more time, because it actually plays at a key moment here. So again, we get that theme played, and this is in pretty much one of the key battles of the game against the Cypher Admins, who are pretty much the bosses of this evil organization. And so you're going from this more lighthearted take on the theme to a more grander, a bit more epic of a scale. But then, it, come, it actually comes back again in the very final battle of the game. Uh, so let us pull this up. So there we hear it again. The one actually cool relationship is that if we compare actually the keys that the two um, the two are in, is that so we have the first battle. Um, so, so it's actually in the key of F major. Um, in this uh, and then but the final battle theme is actually in the key of B flat major. So it, um, so translation is that very often that F will resolve to B flat in music. It's the dominant, it's the fifth of the piece. 
So in a sense, we get this elongated dominant tonic progression going from the key of F having this motif in to having it in the key of B flat. So we get this, in a sense, harmonic resolution throughout the entire course of the game. I'm not sure if that was intended, but it's just a cool little um, tidbit which ends up happening. Uh, and then one more thing that connects the first and the last battles of the game. Uh, let's listen one more time to the opening of the first battle. <laughs> So paying a key, special attention to just that giant string run up to the pretty much what's the head of the piece. Um, because we don't really get that, this soundtrack doesn't actually feature that many string runs, it's very rhythmic in how it deals with its music. But then if we actually listen to the final battle of the, of the piece, um, elongated string run down, which again calls back to the first battle of the game. So in a sense, we get these runs that are bookending the entire game, from the first battle to the last battle, like because very often runs up will dictate that we're leading up to something, we're growing up. And so in the context of this game, we're growing up to the, um, to the meat of the game. We're getting into what's really fun about it, all the battles getting stronger. And then at the very end, as the piece is closing, as the game is closing, we get this rundown which is indicating that things are becoming calm, that the game is ending, your journey is done. And it's a cool little thing that the soundtrack is able to convey without necessarily even need to, needing to know what's going on in the game. Um, so, yeah. That's, I'm, this is just a bunch of cool things I found about the soundtrack and I thought I would help um, share them with all you. Any next questions? Or? Oh, go for it. Yeah, so when, when you were like looking into this, did you like finding like other sources, maybe the developers or the musicians were talking about like why they did some of this stuff? Um, I personally, I didn't really do that much research into this. I was approaching it more from an analysis perspective, but um, actually I'm not even sure who composed the music. Because um, um, I don't think it was because this was this game was developed um, by a separate company that it wasn't Game Freak that developed this game. It was a Genius uh, Sonority or something like that, uh, and so they had a different team that worked on the game. Hello, hello. hello. Do you want me to interrupt? Oh, no, it's, uh, it's fine. We're just, I, we're just um, asking questions. Amazing. But let me um, let me actually just do a quick Google search on that. Um, so actually, I'll talk to a player now. But I will, um, I, I'll, I'll take a quick um, look at that and then I will get back to you on that version. Yeah, I'm not curious. Uh, we'll cut them out later. Sure. Yeah, we can cut it out later. No, I'm, I'm, we, we can, can, can keep it rolling. Oh, yeah, that's it's fine. Cool. It could go on for 90 minutes. Oh, oh really? That's fancy. That's easy. That's easy. Cut it out. That's the one. Yeah, the, um, so the guy who um, composed this one did a lot of actually the Pokemon spin off games. Coliseum, Gale of Darkness. I see. Troze, if you remember that one. I don't. Uh, it was like the Prince, the it was like the matching one, Prince, the Bejeweled Pokemon game. That oh my oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> I know I know what you're talking about. Yeah, that was yeah. That's it. <laughs> well, also, Pokemon Battle that. Revolution, which also had a very it was um, Pokemon Battle Revolution had a very similar. Is it, that was the Wii U game, right? Yeah, that was the, oh, the no, Wii U toys. Wii one. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. It didn't really sell well. It wasn't actually a fantastic game, but the soundtrack still had that. It had a similar style to the way the Coliseum XD games yeah. did it. God, I remember that. <laughs> if anyone has any other questions, feel free to shoot them now. Do you want to do a quick summary? Oh, uh, quick summary. All right. So, so, all right. So, pressure. No, um, so, uh, in three sen in pretty much three sentences, talk about thematic consistency throughout the game. Amazing. How it um, um, changed up the themes to fit various parts of the game, and how it connected the very beginning and, and ending of the game through similar styles in the first battle theme. That's awesome. Super cool. Thank you. Is there anything well, you think it could have done better? Yes, actually, <laughs> um, for one thing, um, is that, first of all, this final battle theme, um, let's actually listen to it, or at least part of it. It feels very, uh, feels very triumphant, very positive, very, I wouldn't say that there are no stakes, but it just has this very uplifting feel to it. 
which would make sense in the context of a game where it's like, it's almost like that this is a formality at this point that you know you're stronger than the opponent. The problem with this battle is that it's the hardest one in the game because it's so, it's like, because, uh, first of all, I think between the previous battle and this one, there's like, I think, a five or six level difference. So there's already a difficulty spike there. The, the opposing team has a bat team built for double battles, so a bunch of earthquake protect combos, typing advantages, uh, I think a freaking Tyranitar on their team. It's obnoxious and so difficult that this very positive, uplifting thing, I think, just serves more to comfort the player rather than to actually fit the game. <laughs> um, let me think. Uh, um, there are a couple. Um, there are a couple pieces that are uh, rather out of place. Um, like for instance, um, there's a, a place called Mount Battle, which is pretty much a training facility um, for the game. But then, in the in the credits theme of the game. No, this is not the best the game. But the, the theme that they use the, that they use for the credits. Oh wait. Oh no, that's the uh, ah. Here's the sample. Oh shoot, wait, my thing is not answering. Right, but yeah, there's the theme again. Why do they call? Why do they reference? But yeah, but then, but then what they go from here is they do the Mount Battle theme for some reason. Even though it really doesn't have that like a core significance in the game. I'm sure it's a cool song, but they're a, but it's not one of the it's not one of the core themes of the game. So that was a decision that sort of confused me. I mean I I suppose there does still need to be a balance between having songs that sound really, really good and songs that are thematically correct and ones that actually summarize the game. So there are just balances and trade-offs you have to make. But this one I'm still not sold on. But then again, I also don't know what was going on behind the scenes, other ideas they may have had or whatnot. So. Finding Paradise. Finding Paradise. I don't know that one. I think that might be cool for you to look at, just thinking about like how to take a main sort of theme song or common progression and making that into a couple of different variations throughout the game. Okay. Cool. Wait, wait, Freebird Games. Yes. No, there was a game. Oh, oh, they, oh, they did two of the Moon Universe, right? That's yes. Right. Oh, okay. It was a game, Crash Team Racing, I don't know if anyone played it. It was, really, it was a good game, believe me. But it had a really funny musical quirk where basically the hub world was the same theme, but as you traveled through it and locked more levels, it added more layer to the music. Yeah. So like if you if you start in the first area and you drive all the way back, it's like literally progressing backwards because you like kinda remember, oh man, I used to be here. And the music is so simple and boring. And like as you literally progress the game, it gives you like that's another way of using it as progression. Yeah, there's some and there are also a couple other cool examples of that. Um, I remember there's actually an 8-bit music theory video on this one, but um, in one of the levels of Banjo-Kazooie, I think it was like one of the seasonal levels where it would actually go through fall, winter, spring, oh, yeah. um, uh, summer, it would actually, the music would change throughout each of those, but the four things of it would actually be the same, which is um, another cool example of how they're... What else does that? Um, doesn't Donkey Kong 64 do that with, with the one level where you can like... I think it's like the Fungi Forest level that does that too. I know one game that does it. Um, is you know, reminisce this was it too? Is um, Delfino Plaza in um, Sir Mario Sunshine? Is that like so? It's got its own. It's like um, so let me just pull it up. Yeah, we made. Rep I think we made reminisce for that idea, like the upgrade dynamic music system. That was the only music. And then all um, Yoshi's Island does the same thing. That. Yeah. So, so we've got like so we've got this um this core part of the hub world. I'm going to see the Thunderbird because it never stops doing that. But then, if you actually get on your Yoshi, you yeah, add that little Just add there. one instrument then you know you have a Yoshi, right? Yeah. Which I think, I think Survivor World levels do the same thing. Like that. Which I think you might have been talking about. Yeah, yeah so Super Mario World does it with Yoshi, but then for the map one specifically, Yoshi Diamond also does, like, the adding of instruments and the oh, layering okay. on. 
And actually, one other um, game that does similar, um, something similar is, I think it was Pokemon Black and White 2, I think um, did a really cool thing with its gym themes. Is that, because in every single gym, like, so it had the main core theme, I'll see if I can actually find some examples, um, but, um, so it had the same core theme, but it would change its style for every single gym. So it would have eight versions of the gym theme. Um, so it would, and so it just created, it made every gym have its own unique taste to it. But it's like the same core challenge that you're doing. Yeah. It has some spin. So like, this like, one, like, got, like, the metal, like, the gym. Yeah. Have you ever seen the fortune gym? Yeah, this is the fortune one. Yeah. Come on, man. Yeah. I've never played this game. But I but I, do, I do know this one. But then, yeah, it's like, I don't even remember who this was. I don't remember the gym. Did you do the gym? I could probably. The, game, the guy's name is Clay, so yeah, well, so it's it's game game Do you know how to play this game? I, I played it as you. I played Black and White 1, and my sister played Black and White 2, and whenever I walked by, she would be playing the gym themes, and they were so good. Yeah. But, like, but every gym so has its own theme that just makes them feel so unique, even though they play off the same core motif. It's kind of cool. Actually, if you go through any soundtrack, you'll be able to find some examples of this. Although, actually, funnily enough, less so in a lot of, in most Pokemon games. They don't really prioritize thematic consistency as much as like the say Pokemon Coliseum and XD did. Because very um, a lot of the core mentality of why I feel those soundtracks have been have just made really good solid soundtracks that fit like fit the theme and the other side that fit the mood or whatever maybe. And they've had some phenomenal tracks, believe me. But there hasn't been a lot of like but they didn't reuse material as much well, as in other games. Do you think that's because Pokemon's like less of a narrative focused game? And Pokemon Close even more has like a, this is like an actual journey rather than like, you know, just going on a crazy adventure. You see, normally I would say yes, but the one part I disagree with is the very, is the fact that they use um, that um, one theme in the opening sequence, the first battle, and then the last battle, um, that one theme. Like that one. And that that itself signifies like the like the trainer or the player's growth throughout the game. Whereas that would actually be much more fitting in a normal yeah Pokemon yeah where you like level up and you this is the oldest right. adventure. Where the point of it is to get stronger, become the very best like no one ever was. So, I mean that's right, that's right. But whereas this one is just whereas in the Pokemon Coliseum XD, it's about take down the baddies. Right, as you say. Are they not, like, I feel like that should be a more common trick in video games too, because they have layering music, but I feel like it's not used mm. as much as it should be. What is it? Layering itself, I feel like, could be, like, a whole different topic on yeah. um, um, Two examples, like, more recent examples that I think of. Um, one that I don't know that much, but I heard does layering is Pyre. Um, yeah. I forgot, what was it's, the uh, the, the, the guys who made Bastion and... Superdrag. Ah, yes. Darren Korb is a composer for Pyre, and he invents his whole. He talks about uh, inventing a new genre mm -hmm. with each of the games. I don't know if you've seen it. Like Bastion, he called uh, acoustic frontier trip hop. That was his like invention for the sport of Bastion. Have you heard some of these? So they're awesome. I I haven't listened to this. I want to play. I want to experience right. everything. Yes, yeah, you should everybody. Uh, but Pyre, yeah. Um, there's like a song for each of the other tribes that you can play against, which has layers of different instruments depending on which characters you pick for your team. Okay. So it like constructs a different song. Um, it's almost dynamic. Combine that so with cool. different words to the songs depending on which order you free your characters in the game. Mm. And then the closing soundtrack, like the credit song, is like a custom tailored your story, like, like of, of your oh, cool. adventure <laughs> through this world. Um, Did you say it's like Mad Libs? Okay, but like with exactly. sound clips, like yeah. musical and lyrical Mad Libs in this very cool final, like closing kind of like bard-like song. It's really awesome. Really good game. Yes, yeah, so that's a great example, of Larry. And another one, real quickly. Um, it's not the main focus of the game, but like there's like. I don't know if this spoils this. There's a scene in a game called Night in the Woods. Oh, oh. Where, yes, um, it almost kind of teaches you what layering is. Because what you do in that level is that there's nothing, it's almost pitch black, but you just walk around and there's four different like musicians 
playing the same song. But once you encounter one musician, they'll play like, let's say, it's the fiddler, and they'll just play the violin over and over, but it sounds just lonely with just the violin playing. And then you meet the rest of the quartet, and you see that the layers actually just yeah. pile up on each other. And then in the end, like when you unlock or like meet all the four musicians, it's almost magical. Yeah. Like yeah. even the scenery, like sometimes there's like players out there that just stop playing and just like sit back for a minute. But it's powerful. Yeah. It's awesome. There's one other game in particular that made that like um I actually just thought of is um, Legend of Zelda Spirit Tracks. Oh my god, you're right. I forgot yeah, that you did that. Yeah. So, oh, that's so yes. legendary. So, like, so, okay, so, Prince, uh, so, um, um, so, Prince, you have to Pandora go around to all the two. Pandora Glass of the two. What? Pandora Glass of the as well. <coughs> Except the music is like a core part of Spirit Tracks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a game. So, Prince, so, for context, for those that haven't played, is you have to go around to all these different temples and, like, um, you have to, you'll pretty much play a duet with one of these sages. And then they they have their own tune, and then you'll play along with them. And they each have their own different thing. But then in the very final battle of the game, the fi very final act, like so, you play a duet with Zelda. But then as you're doing that, the rest of these sages come in with all the melodies that you played with them, and it just all converges to this one piece. Yeah, um, my, it blew my mind when I realized that all the songs I've been playing the entire game were actually just one big song. I was like, wow. It's it's a beautiful song. Wow. Um, I think the trick. And then and that just leads right into the final battle theme. So like this is where you'll actually play along and use the microphone and the 3DS and it's garbage because I took me forever to Kind of getting yeah. I do have to leave. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Alright. I don't want to use the camera.